Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to the final part of our series of videos focusing on lesser known female serial killers. If you haven't seen parts 1 and 2, be sure to check those out first. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part 3 of three lesser known female serial killers. As morbid as it may sound, it's a bit of a mystery as to why the crimes of Velma Barfield haven't earned more notoriety over the years. Though she was only convicted of killing one person, she confessed to several other murders, and it's believed that she is responsible for the deaths of at least six people. Barfield was also the first woman in the United States to be executed following the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976, and was the first woman to die via lethal injection. But what's perhaps simultaneously most noteworthy and disturbing about the crimes of Velma Barfield is that she was able to get away with them for so long, even as anyone who seemingly got close to her ended up dying under mysterious circumstances. Velma was born Margie Velma Bullard to parents Murphy and Lillian Bullard in October of 1932. She would go on to become the second oldest of the Bullard's nine children. Shortly after Velma's birth, the family was forced to give up their small cotton and tobacco farm in rural North Carolina, moving in with her father's parents near Fayetteville. It was here that Velma would spend most of her childhood growing up in poverty, where her father became increasingly physically abusive towards her and her siblings, and her mother failed to intervene. By age 17, Velma had had enough and in 1949, she married her 18-year-old boyfriend, Thomas Burke, in order to escape her abusive home life. For a time, Velma and Thomas were happy together, and the couple would go on to have two children, Ronnie and Kim. In a later interview, Kim would recall that during this time, they were a typical all-American family, and that she fondly remembered picnics, trips to the beach, and vacations that the four of them would take together. Things reportedly took a turn for the worse after Velma had a hysterectomy in 1963 and developed back pain. Friends and family noticed an immediate change in Velma's behavior following the surgery. She had wild mood swings and became noticeably resentful towards her husband, especially when he would drink with his friends. Tensions were further exacerbated in the household when Thomas was injured in a car accident in 1965, causing him to lose his job. From that point on, he suffered from chronic headaches and further turned to alcohol to escape from his problems. Despite her resentment of her husband's drinking problem, Velma was soon grappling with an addiction of her own, after she was given prescription sedatives to deal with her stress and pain issues. Over the next few years, the marriage devolved to the point where Velma and Thomas were barely speaking to one another, outside of their frequent and volatile arguments. Then. In April of 1969, Thomas died suddenly. The local papers reported that he had been found at home by Velma after she had returned from work one afternoon. The cause of death was determined to be asphyxiation from smoke inhalation, and it was said that Thomas had likely fallen asleep while smoking in bed, starting a fire. Curiously, the actual damage from the fire was relatively minor. It was reported that only a portion of the mattress where Burke had been lying was burned, as well as some nearby clothing and an area of the floor. After that, tragedy seemed to follow Velma wherever she went. For starters, a second fire mysteriously broke out in her home just a few months after Thomas died, this time burning the house to the ground. Velma and her children moved in with her parents for a short time while they waited for the insurance money. In 1970, it appeared that she had found love again, when she met and married a man who had also recently lost his spouse, named Jennings Barfield. However, the marriage quickly fell into turmoil because of Velma's drug use. Less than a year after their marriage, the couple planned to divorce, but before they could go through with it, Barfield died suddenly. It was determined that the cause had been from heart complications. Widowed a second time, Velma once again moved in with her parents. While her father's death shortly after her arrival genuinely seems to have been from lung cancer, 
it didn't take long for her mother to fall mysteriously ill as well, just as the relationship between her and Velma started to sour. In the summer of 1974, Lillian Bullard began to experience serious stomach pains, accompanied by intense symptoms of diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea. However, following a hospitalization, she recovered within a few days. Doctors had no idea what was wrong with her, and she was allowed to return home. Near the end of the year, she was admitted again to the hospital with the exact same symptoms, but this time she succumbed to the unknown illness. Somehow, Velma again managed to avoid suspicion, and no autopsy was performed on Lillian's body. After briefly being incarcerated for writing bad checks to feed her drug habit, Velma began working as a caretaker and home aide for an elderly couple named Dolly and Montgomery Edwards in 1976. By March of 1977, both of the Edwards were dead. They had fallen ill and died within just over a month of one another, each with symptoms similar to those that had killed Velma's mother. Incredibly, after the deaths of the Edwards, Velma managed to secure a second job taking care of an elderly couple, that of John Henry Lee and his wife Record Lee. By June of 1977, John Henry Lee was dead. His doctor said they thought it was from a severe stomach virus. Despite this long track record of death, it wouldn't be until Velma had claimed the life of one final victim that authorities intervened. It started after Velma began seeing the nephew of Dolly Edwards, a man named Roland Stewart Taylor. The couple had begun seeing each other in 1976 and planned to get married. But when Taylor found out that Velma was forging checks in his name at the end of 1977 to feed her drug habit, he called the marriage off. By February of 1978, Taylor was also dead. However, unlike in the other cases, Testing was done on Taylor's body, revealing the presence of arsenic. Velma was subsequently arrested, and after police received a tip about other deaths in her past, it started a chain reaction, resulting in the exhumations of Dolly Edwards, John Henry Lee, Lillian Bullard, and Jennings Barfield. Testing revealed traces of arsenic in all of their bodies. Velma first denied doing anything wrong, but subsequently admitted to killing Taylor by poisoning his beer and tea. Confronted with the additional evidence from the exhumations, she admitted to three of the murders, but strangely denied killing Jennings Barfield. Just like in Taylor's murder, Velma claimed that she had committed most of the poisonings after stealing money from her victims. Sometimes she had forged checks, and in her mother's case, she had taken out a loan in her name. Velma claimed that she only wanted to make her victims sick enough so that she could nurse them back to health while she looked for another job to pay back what she had stolen. The explanation turned out to be a weak excuse in court, and Velma was convicted of Taylor's murder and sentenced to death. It is unclear why the state never chose to pursue charges against her in connection with any of the other deaths, particularly the ones that she had confessed to, but perhaps they considered this irrelevant considering her death sentence. In the years that followed Velma Barfield's conviction, news began to circulate that she had become a devout Christian and that she had even started ministering to other prisoners, earning her recognition from popular religious figures such as Reverend Billy Graham. As a result, many in the public began to believe that she was no longer the same person that she had been when she was incarcerated, leading to a major push for her sentence to be commuted to life in prison. An appeal was also made on the basis that Velma suffered from dissociative identity disorder, supposedly brought on in part by the abuse she suffered at the hands of her father, which she now claimed had been sexual in nature. However, the families of Velma's victims rejected the narrative that she had suddenly changed. They said that Velma had appeared to be a kind and devoutly religious person well before she was ever incarcerated, and that this was what had made the revelation of her crime so shocking. Many of the victim's family members felt that this was nothing more than an attempt to rehabilitate her image so that she could avoid facing justice for her crimes. Ultimately, Velma's appeal was denied by a federal court, after which she instructed her legal team to abandon further appeal efforts. She was executed via lethal injection on November 2nd, 1984, at the age of 52. That brings us to the end of our list. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. 
As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.